Welcome to church. Why don't you stand as we sing to our amazing God to start our service off with.
Father God, we thank you for all we have. We thank you for all you give us. We know that all good things come from you. We thank you that we are here this morning. Give us all we need, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a seat. Welcome again. Welcome if you're with us online as well. Um, it's great to see you all here this morning. Before we get too far into it, I am going to remind our U5 to 8 kids it's time for you to get out. <laughs> we love you. We'll see you later. Uh, we have a program for our U5 to 8 kids. If you're not aware, uh, they head on out for their learning time and then they'll come back again at the end. And next week, we have gate crash, which means they'll be staying in the service with us in the morning um, and then they'll have church at night. No, they won't be staying in. They'll be doing their own thing in the morning, but they'll come in at night and come and do church at 5 p.m., um, which you're all welcome to come along to. Maybe you know someone in that age group who might appreciate that. Uh, we'd love to see you there. Uh, the following week, so next week's the 11th, the following week on the 18th, we have our new to life. So if you are new or if you feel new or you um, are just kind of wondering what we're on about here or you've got some questions, uh, we'd love to invite you to new to life. If that's something that sounds appealing or that you'd like to join into, um, come and see me or any of the team um, and we'll give you all of the details. It will be here. Uh, so we'd love to see you coming along to that. If you are new, uh, or if you're visiting, you may have received a card when you came in, a contact card. Uh, or if you're online and you'd like to engage a little bit more, there'll be a link on the, on the uh, screen for you. Uh, we'd love for you to fill that out and tell us a little bit about yourselves, um, what brought you along, um, so just so that we can get in touch and let you know what we're on about here at um, Life Anglican Riverston. Last week, we had our Life Group Sunday. Uh, we heard a little bit about what was happening in Life Groups. Uh, so I'll invite you to, to look at the screens and we'll have a little bit of a recap of what we talked about last week. Getting together with people that um, we might see once or twice at church, but we'll see every week regularly. They become friends and we share their lives. It's not really hard for me to get to it because it's at my house, but hard sometimes when things are busy and making sure it's happening. And because it's important to connect with each other and that's what we should be doing. And God wants us to be growing in Christ and that's the way that we can do that. Life groups are a great way to um, get deeper into God's word, but also just to make some really good friends and relationships and have people that we can do life together. So if that's something that you're not part of yet uh, and you've got some questions or you just want to know a little bit more, we're going to have the table down the back again um, and Frank and Rachel will be there uh, to answer any of your questions. We're not going to lock you in and sign you up, um, but we will answer your questions and show you some of the options that are available if that's something that you'd like to do. So that'll be today after the service. Uh, if you're online, there's a QR code. You can jump on and put your details in there and we'll get in touch with you that way. Uh, we're going to watch another thing on the screen uh, and then Dan's going to come up and have a bit of a chat with us about it. Very fun. Uh, we have the Akuna Matata uh, Choir, Children's Choir, coming to our church 
uh, on the 3rd of March, which is super exciting. This is one of those things, um, I received an email some time ago, you know, are you interested in this? Um, as the process went, you know, I received lots of emails, people requesting kind of partnerships and support, uh, and it, it hit a point where we were like, is this, you know, actually going to happen, but we met with uh, Pastor Tom, who heads up the choir this week online. Um, they got delayed uh, by two weeks to start their tour, um, and so they're still on schedule for us, but they're going to be in the country this week uh, and uh, travelling around Australia, and they're coming to join us here, which I think is just a, such an incredible opportunity for us. Um, they're connected to uh, an orphanage in Kenya and um, part of what we will do as they come is uh, on the Sunday they're here we will have an extra offertory. I mean we don't pass an offertory bag around um, after COVID so we still have our regular giving online but if you would like to give to the orphanage work that they are involved in uh, the easiest way to do that will be to bring cash on the day of the choir to give towards them. Uh, we can talk about digital options if that's more helpful, but that's gonna be the easiest way. Uh, super exciting. Couple of things we wanna think about leading up to that. Uh, I think it's a great uh, opportunity to invite people along. Uh, it's such a, a different thing for us and um, such a great way to celebrate uh, the gospel around the world as we uh, have another culture come and celebrate uh, with us. And so they will be taking over a most of the service that day. It'll be uh, all about them at the 10 a.m. and 5 p.m. service. We'll be merging our 8 and 10 together at 10 a.m. on that morning. Super exciting. Uh, so the first thing is there will be an offer tree and that's one way to support them. The second thing is uh, we are going to have them with us the whole week leading up to that week. So the Monday before the 3rd of March right through to the 3rd of March, they're with us all week. They will come to our play group on Tuesday morning and, uh, and do some music with the kids there. They will come to our youth group on Friday night. They are ages 11 to 13. There's nine girls, uh, six boys, um, 16, uh, 15 of them all up, uh, 11 to 13. So they will come to our youth group and uh, I think there'll be a combination of us wanting to kind of bless them with giving them just some fun and activities with our youth group an opportunity for our youth to kind of lift their eyes beyond the immediate and think about the global uh, church as well. So super exciting about, uh, about that. Um, what we need to do is provide accommodation for them for the week. Uh, there's a number of ways that we can do that, but the best way we think to do that is if people have space in their houses that they might be able to for a week host ideally uh, two to three children and one adult. Uh, there'll be uh, a number of adults coming with them. They have some teachers that come with them. And so during the week, they, uh, every day they'll get dropped off here at the church. We will set up some tables for them to basically do school here at church during the day. Um, and so it'll be house them, uh, give them breakfast, drop them off at the church. Uh, there, it won't be a tight schedule, at least most days. So there'll be some flexibility to fit your schedule for dropping them off and we'll work out uh, whether it'll be pick up or drop, or we'll find a way to drop them back to people's houses. So I, I know that's not everyone and uh, that has that kind of space, that capacity. And if you do, talk to me or if you know uh, Melissa Churchwood, if you know who she is, grab her after the service, let her know. Even if there's a possibility we want to talk about it, um, uh, it's a great experience for if you have kids and you want to uh, share your house with them, there's a great experience for your family uh, during that week. So we'd love to have those opportunities. The second thing is to try to help balance that is if you think you might be able to provide a food, food for essentially 25 people, um, depending who, what other leaders are around at the time, um, we can do lunches here, we can do dinners here that will help relieve some of the pressure on homes that are hosting families. So if you're able to provide a meal, then also talk to us if you think that's something you can help out with. So uh, hosting, a couple of kids, ideally a couple of kids and an adult, or, um, or a meal. Talk to me, talk to Melissa. Super exciting, really looking forward to it. Uh, it's gonna be a great blessing for us, not just on the Sunday, but the opportunity for the whole week. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we don't pass around an offer tree for our regular giving here, but it is still something that's really important to us as a church. And uh, we wanna really encourage you to continue to support the kingdom as we build treasures in heaven and not treasures on earth. Uh, and uh, the best way to do that is through online giving, uh, and you can go to our website to do that, but here's just our little video that reminds us of why we give.
join with me in prayer? I should probably use the microphone. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning in gratitude for your grace and wisdom. We ask that you would bless us with your presence and your guidance so that we may live according to your will. We ask your love and peace to be with us always, that we may have the strength to live lives that honour you. We pray that you would feed us and sustain us with the wellspring of water that only you can provide. Father, we lift up those who have been affected by war and armed conflict all around the world. We know that it's reported that at the moment there are nearly 100 current armed conflicts. We think in particular of Israel, Yemen, Iran, Pakistan, Ukraine, Russia. We also bring before you the rising tensions with China and Taiwan, and even the instability within America between federal and state authorities. We pray, Lord, that you would comfort the families who have lost loved ones. We ask that you would bring hope to those in sorrow and give strength and wisdom to those who are involved in conflict, who are involved in um, support, medical aid, food, clothing, shelter. We ask that your love would flow through us, that we may reach out to those in need with compassion and generosity. We ask that the love of Christ would shine through us as you bring healing and hope into this world. We think, Lord, of other things that are going on in the coming weeks. We pray for those who are searching for our identity, especially those who are participating in the upcoming Pride Week celebrations. We pray, Father, that you would help them to find their identity in you and your love for them, that they may know they are deeply valued. We pray that as Christians we might reflect your love and grace to all of those around us, to extend your kindness and compassion to those who are struggling to find their place in the world. We pray, Lord, that as we seek to act in love and kindness, that you would help us not to change your unchanging truth and to make it more palatable or acceptable to the world. We pray, Lord, for integrity in our compassion and our love. Lord, we lift up our own church, both local and within the Sydney Diocese. We think of our Archbishop Kanishka, our Bishop Gary. We pray for our ministers, Miles and Dan. We ask, Lord, that as they lead your church community, you would give them wisdom, that you would give them uh, your understanding of the gospel, that you would fill them with your Holy Spirit. We pray for our local governments. We think of our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, we think of our Premier, Chris Minns. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them as they lead our nation. And we pray for all those who work in government, that their hearts and minds would be so directed as to do your will. We pray that they would be guided by you and your principles and that they would aspire to your love and grace and that they might be motivated by a desire to bring the kingdom of God here on earth. We think of our worldwide church. We pray, Lord, that we might be the light to the world. We pray that you would help us to be serv servants to others. And we pray for your peace, hope and justice within our world. Again, may we not be afraid to speak your truth, which is very countercultural within our own country and more broadly. We pray, Father, that we might have the courage to share the gospel and the good news of Christ with those around us. We thank you in this country. We do not need to fear physical violence. And we think of our brothers and sisters in other countries who are persecuted when they share their faith in you. We ask, Lord, that you would protect them, that you would give them courage and strength. Almighty God, we do trust in you and your protection. And we thank you for the words in Psalm 121 in which you let us know that you are our help and our shield, that you will not let our foots be moved, feet be moved, and the one who keeps us will not slumber. We give you thanks for your unwavering care and protection, and we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.
Good morning. The Bible reading this morning is from Matthew 7, 24 to 29. Now, if you're new or a visitor, you may have been given a Bible when you came in, and that is yours to keep, and by all means, bring it along next time you visit us in church. So the Bible reading this morning is Matthew 7, 24 to 29. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes in torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. But anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds a house on sand. When the rain floods come, and the winds beat against the house, it will collapse with a mighty crash. When Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, quite unlike their teachers of religious law. Thanks, Grant. Hi again. <laughs> Thanks. Good to know you're still there. Great. I'm also still here. Let me uh, read something to you that uh, Susie, um, my wife, uh, pointed out to me this week. There's many things she points out to me during the week and, uh, uh, and worth listening to. But in particular, um, she um, has been listening to a podcast by Paul David Tripp. Uh, we both really love the teaching of Paul Tripp, really fantastic. Um, if you're looking for a podcast to listen to, I highly recommend him, or uh, he's an award-winning author. He, um, he's a counsellor who's also uh, gone into pastoral work and particularly pioneered um, biblically, biblical counselling, or at least uh, furthered the work of biblical counselling, built a framework to think about counselling and how we use the Bible well in thinking about that. And so that comes out in his preaching, and I think it's really terrific. He wrote a book called um, Forever, Why You Can't Live Without It, is what it's called. And uh, his podcast is based on that book. The podcast is called um, Living For Forever. It's, it's a presentation he gave at a conference, and it's kind of broken up into digestible pieces. Really great, thinking about perspective of heaven and eternity. Uh, and this is something he says in his podcast. Let me read this to you. Um, he says, The evidence is clear that life is not all that, it, that there is. If this is all that there is, we are in big trouble. And he gives some examples of what that looks like. He says, Like the cry of a baby who's in an incubator, suffering from a disease that that baby doesn't understand. It's a screaming message. This can't be all that there is. Or the fear of a third grader who doesn't appear to be particularly popular and fears the abuse and bullying that he receives at school so bad that he dreads even attending. This is a screaming message. This can't be all that there is. Or the lostness of a teen who seems hell-bent on destroying their life. This is a screaming cry. There can't be, there can't, this can't be all that there is. Or the bitterness of a couple who once adored each other, whose heart lifted when they heard the other's voice and now can barely keep a civil conversation it's a screaming cry, this can't be all there is. Or the disease that is like a hand that reaches in and yanks the life out of a 30-year-old. It's a clear message, isn't it? That this can't be all that there is. Or the groaning death of an elderly person that just about loses their entire personality through that process. It's a crying message that this can't be all that it is, that there is, but we treat it like it is all that it is. We don't seem to get the message. 
Paul Chip Tripp puts this challenge. He says, I would propose to you that sometime in the last month, in a moment of joy or in a moment of anger, of frustration, of disappointment, you actually acted like this is all that there is. He says, it seems like Christians have ticked off eternity as something we believe in. But I wonder if we really are really living like people who actually believe there's such a thing, actually believe as if there is such a thing as forever. This morning we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount. And I think it's a great summary of the Sermon on the Mount to think about Jesus teaching us what living for forever looks like. About pursuing God's eternal kingdom. What that really looks like. And Paul Tripp says that kind of perspective, living for forever transforms everything. It's a transformational truth. It changes everything you do and think and say. We would call this, sermon, this series Upside Down Kingdom because that's the same thing Jesus is saying, that the truth about the kingdom turns everything on its head. It turns everything upside down. And we get to this conclusion, and we read the story of the wise and foolish builder building on rock and sand, and really this is the final part of the conclusion. We started the conclusion last week. As Jesus rounds up his sermon that he's been doing, he gives us three pairs of comparisons. The first one we looked at last week, the two paths, the wide and the narrow road, or really the language is the two gates that lead to the two paths. The language Jesus is saying is uh, the start of salvation, the start of the spiritual journey is, is choosing the right path. It's being on the right path. And we looked at this last week saying any other path is not truly living. And so there's a picture of the paths are a picture of the beginning of faith. He talks about the picture of two types of fruit. Say so pursue, pursue good fruit, kingdom fruit. And pursuing bad fruit is not part of the kingdom. And, and there's a picture of growing in faith. And we get to this last one, the one we read today, the two buildings. There's a picture of endurance to the end. It's about building a forever home is the picture. A home that will not fall apart, that will not be destroyed. The picture is living for, forever by building this forever home. And the key we hear here is Jesus is the foundation. And b obedience is the way that we build on that foundation. I think it's clear that Jesus is the foundation in this story. I, I, I heard one, I think a really respected... Um, preacher, someone that I, I respect a lot, who, who analyzed this passage and said, uh, his words, all the commentaries say it's Jesus, but I've been thinking about it and I think something else. I mean, that's always, I'm not saying commentaries are always right, but you want to walk carefully if you're walking into that space. He says, I think the foundation is obedience. Listen to what, what we read here. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows right? That's the obedience bit. Anyone who listens to my teaching and follows is, is wise, like a person who builds their house on solid rock. The contrast, similar language, but anyone who hears my teaching and doesn't obey it is foolish, like a person who builds house on the sand. The two people both hear the teaching of Jesus. That's quite interesting, isn't it? I mean, it makes sense. The challenge here is actually to the listeners Jesus is talking to, right? They're, he they're hearing right there and then, the teaching of Jesus. So both groups hear the teaching, but only one, only the wise, only the one that's building a building that's going to last is the one that obeys. And so this preacher's argument is, so the rock is obedience. But I think that's, that's not correct. I want to hold to, to what I said. I think it's more likely that obedience is the act of building on that rock. That's what's happening here. The one who is wise is the one who obeys by building on the solid foundation. The solid foundation, I think it's clear, I think it's important for us to say, the solid foundation is Jesus. Jesus is a sure foundation, Matthew wants to tell us. One of the themes in the, the Gospel of Matthew is the theme of kingship. 
It's really important to Matthew to really assert and make clear Jesus is the king. He's the rightful king. And that's part of the reason why we call the, the sermon series Upside Down Kingdom because of Jesus the king. He's the rightful king. And, uh, and Paul wants to say, uh, Matthew wants to say, he is the authoritative king. We read that at the end of this verse. It's actually the first time this theme comes out in the Gospel of Matthew, verse 28 and 29. The crowds were amazed at his teaching, for he taught with real authority, they said, quite unlike the teachers of religious law. Matthew wants to assert Jesus is the rightful king and he comes with a certain authority. What does it mean, unlike the teachers of the law? It seems unlikely that the teachers of the law ever didn't try to assert their authority. Certainly, it seems like they are trying to assert their authority over Jesus all the time. I'm sure some of the teachers of the law demanded people obey with a kind of authority. But there's something more going on here for Jesus. There's something more that the people are hearing in his teaching. And Matthew wants to make it clear he's the rightful king because he's the one with authority. It's mentioned here and he builds that theme through his gospel. The very next chapter, Jesus calms the storm. He is the one that not just has authority in kind of bold preaching, but he's the kind of authority that even the wind and the waves listens to his voice. I mean, that's some kind of bold preaching right there. Or the very next chapter after that, he heals a paralyzed man. And the thing he says is, your sins are forgiven, he says to the paralyzed man. Everyone's shocked. And then he says, so that you will know that the Son of Man, talking about himself, has the authority to forgive sins, I say to this man, take up your mat and walk. And he does. Matthew says, this is the kind of authority we're talking about. Not authoritative like he preaches well, but authority that goes much bigger than that, authority that's rooted in his very identity. And, and Matthew has already shown us that. Because just in this very chapter, he said, Jesus calls God my father. He has the kind of authority where he can talk to God as a father, which is not something that Israel did in that kind of way. Even more than that, and probably most astounding, is he depicts in verse 22 that he is the one that will be there on judgment day when those that have pretended to be followers but not true followers, it is him there on judgment day. I mean, I don't know if it gets any more authoritative than that. Matthew says, this is the guy... This is the foundation, and you can be sure of this foundation because who he is, he is the rightful king. And obedience is the blueprint to build a house on him. True belief is not just a head thing. It's not just a mouth thing. True obedience is a life thing. True obedience is transformational in every part of your life. And obedience is the blueprint for building your life on Jesus. And it's important that we get this right. It's important that we remember that Jesus is the foundation. Because if our own obedience is the foundation, what happens when we don't perfectly obey? You call yourself a follower of Jesus, but we know sin still is there. We know temptation is still there. If your foundation for building an, a forever home is obedience, then your hope forever is that you are perfectly obeying. So what happens if that's your foundation? What if it happens if that's the thing? The very thing that might be the storm that rocks your life is the temptation that you wrestle with, the temptation even that you fail to, the temptation that you may feel like is breaking you. If, if obedience is your foundation... You're stuffed. That's the, but Jesus is the foundation. And it's important that Jesus is the foundation. The great news of the good news about Jesus is that our obedience isn't the foundation. Our job is not to build a tower to God. The good news about Jesus is that God reached down and scooped us up. The foundation that is Jesus is one that has come down and brought us to him. That is the good news of Jesus. That is our hope. It's good news that Jesus is the foundation when following Jesus feels like it doesn't make sense, when obedience is confusing to us. That, that happens, doesn't it? There's times where you know what is the right thing to do, 
But your brain kind of finds other reasons why that may not be the best thing to do. For example, Jesus says the right thing to do is pursue humility. And then there's times where we think the best thing for me would be to assert myself, to get ahead of others. The best thing for my self-worth is to assert myself in that way. Or Jesus says to pursue generosity. Jesus says to pursue generosity sacrificially to the point where it hurts and often in ways that we won't see a return. But our brain will say, you know, the best thing for me is to invest my money in a way that sets up my security, that has a return for me. It's good that Jesus is our foundation in those moments that we're reminded the best thing for us is to trust in him. Or Jesus says we should pursue purity. A big part of the Sermon on the Mount is about adultery and lust. Uh, and so we know that the way Jesus says sex is something that is designed for marriage. And that goes in the face of the culture we live in. Those around us who would say, actually, the wisest, best thing for you, the best thing for you is to enjoy yourself and express yourself sexually. The best thing for your relationships is to make sure you've properly explored all length and breadth of that relationship before you embark on marriage. Jesus says, pursue purity. And at times, that feels like not the best thing for us. And it's such a radical thing. It calls the single person who isn't marriage, married to live a celibate single life. That is a hard call for someone who hasn't found someone to get married to, maybe desperately desiring relationship, maybe even in some relationships but not married. The call of this kind of pursuing Jesus is to continue a celibate life. The same thing is true for someone who is in a, a loveless, a marriage that is uh, not fulfilling their sexual desires. The call is to continue to be faithful in that marriage and not pursue gratification outside of that. The same thing is true as we think about same-sex attracted people. This hard calling is that we might live celibate lives if we're not in a, a marriage between a man and a woman. Jesus pushes this standard so high, he says, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, adultery, but I tell you, even lusting after someone is a problem here. This is the call, it's so countercultural, and we quickly try to justify it in our heads and try to say, look, God must want the best thing for me, so I'm going to figure out what the best thing is for me, and surely that's God honouring. It is good that Jesus is our foundation and not our own logical brains that we would focus on obedience over that. Trust in Jesus is our foundation even when it doesn't make sense to us, even when it's countercultural. It's good that Jesus is our foundation when other Christians fail us. The church is not the foundation we build on. Other Christians in our lives are not the foundation that we build on. I thought as I was preparing that maybe it was helpful to you know, share a story of uh, uh, something that's happened to someone, that moment where um, that trust has been broken. And I don't think we need to. I don't think your brains need to go very far before you can think of a, a moment, a situation where someone who is a Christian or called themselves a Christian or the history of the church, people that did things in the name of Christ, have let us down. And if the church is our foundation, then what do we do when that happens? If other Christians are our foundation, the, the, um, the youth leader that groups of kids respected and heard them proclaim Jesus decide that they're not really a Christian and they walk away from Jesus. What does that do to all those kids? The, the pastor 
who proclaims purity from the platform like I just did, but in their private life isn't pursuing that. The mature Christian that you've come to respect and you find out there's things in their life that just aren't honouring God. If that's our foundation, it will come crumbling down in those moments. It is good that the church and the other Christians and even the idea of Christianity itself is not our foundation. Jesus is our foundation. Because when the storms come, that's what we want to have our hope in. This is the picture of the storms that Jesus gives us. He says, when the rains come in torrents and the flood waters rise and the winds beat against the house, he says it won't collapse because it is built on bedrock. I really like uh, the translation from the New Living Translation there. I think it's really accurate to the original Greek. It's not just built on a rock. This is built on bedrock. No other foundation will last. If you are trusting in your finances, they are not a sure and steady hope for your future. If you are trusting in your health, in your personal ability, in your capacity, in your capability, in your ability to be successful at things you put your hand to, that is not a trustworthy thing to commit eternity into, to commit the rest of your life into. If you're trusting even in your family and friends and relationships around you, no other foundation will keep out the rain, will keep out the hail, will hold back the floodwaters, will hold the house together. Paul Tripp's language, we said at the start, shows clearly the storms will come and at times they are fierce. And they, they smash our houses around. Jesus says he needs to be the foundation if you're building for eternity. And so it's transformational. It transforms everything in our life. It's important that Jesus is in the, fa- the foundation, but it's also important we actually build on that foundation. It's not good enough just to say he is the foundation. We need to take that blueprint and we need to start putting it into action and we need to start building the house on him because that is the thing that anchors us in our faith. Obedience in Jesus anchors us in our faith. It's the thing that guides us even in the times when we feel like we know better. Obedience is the thing that guides us into the place that will take us through the storm. It builds that foundation and it transforms everything. Jesus says it transforms our prayers. He says that's why we will be praying, your kingdom come, your will be done. He says it transforms our investments. Let me, let me come back to Paul Tripp and conclude with this. Paul Tripp analyzes our culture, particularly he's thinking about uh, Western American culture that he lives to in. I think we can hear a lot of this Um, In different ways, different cultures will see this differently. But he says this, We live in a culture that in no way encourages, enforces, or stimulates a reality of forever. He gives some examples. He says, at university classes, not many this year, if any, will invest in a stimulating discussion about eternity. Movies that come out this year, not many, if any, will have eternity as an important part of the plot. Some do, it happens, but it's not a key component of most movies. The news, as you watch it, it won't finish its broadcast after talking about all the terrible things that are happening. It's not going to finish and say, but remember, this is not all that there is. There is a forever. I'm Peter Overton. Good night. (laughs) It's not going to happen. Paul Tripp doesn't say Peter Overton, just so you know. It's not going to happen. Paul Tripp says this, There has been a radical shift in the philosophy, in the operational theology of Western culture that has taken eternity away from us. Somebody stole eternity And it is killing us.
Jesus finishes his sermon reminding us that this is about building a forever home, not about building a good home now, not about building the best home on this earth you can. It's about building a forever home and it transforms every part of the way you think, of the way you feel, of the way you spend your time, of the way you spend your investments, of the way you think about planning for the future, of the way you raise your family, of the, the choices you make in your workplace. It transforms every part of your world. If you are building on Jesus a forever home that looks into eternity, it's a transforming thing that impacts every part of your world. And so here is the challenge we want to finish with. In what places are you not thinking about eternity? And what places are you right now living without that perspective? In what places are you building a home now instead of that forever home? Because nothing we build on other than Jesus will keep out the hail, the, 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 hail, the rain, the floodwaters, only Jesus. He is the sure foundation. He is the one that will last into eternity and obedience is the way that we build our house on him. Let me pray. Lord God, we, we thank you that you are the sure foundation and we know so often we take our eyes off that. We put our eyes on things in front of us. We often think we know what is best for our lives. We pray, Lord, that we will hold on to you as our sure foundation and that obedience will be the blueprint of which we build that house. I pray, Lord, that you will be transforming every part of our life to live with forever in mind. Amen. Let's stand and sing together.
God, we thank you for the time we've had together this morning. We thank you that you are great. We thank you that you are sovereign. We thank you that you are the firm foundation that we will build our lives on. We pray that as we go out into this week, Lord, that you will continue to remind us that we don't need to put our faith in anything else, that we don't need to do anything but to build our lives on you. And please show us how to do that in the big things and in the small things that we will build our lives on you and that everything else can wash away because you will hold us firm. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, we're going to join morning tea. We've got coffee up the back happening. We would love for you to stay. It's a really hot day today. Um, so we're going to have morning tea inside. So if you are fit and able, I would love for you to help us with just stacking a few chairs so that we have room to meet together and stand together. And we'll see you next week.